Good afternoon, and welcome to the 59th program in the Harlan E. Boyle's Distinguished Lecture Series. This semester, the Walker College is honored to host this event in conjunction with the Appalachian Regional and Business Symposium and Appalachian's chapter of the National Association for Business Economics. As a result of the long-standing Boyle series, students have learned from and interacted with high-level business executives on our campus for nearly 30 years. This event is just one example of how we're able to achieve our mission, delivering transformational educational experiences that prepare and inspire our students to be ethical, innovative, and engaged business leaders who positively impact our community, both locally and globally. It's now my pleasure to introduce our platform party. Dr. Sandy Benoit, Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and Research for the Walker College of Business. Dr. John Whitehead, Chair of the Department of Economics. Ms. Jacqueline Hundley, President of Appalachian's Chapter of the National Association for Business Economics. And finally, but not least, today's featured business, uh, business speaker, economic speaker, Dr. John Sylvia, Chief Economist for Wells Fargo. I now invite Sandy Benoit to bring greetings on behalf of the Appalachian Research in Business Symposium. Sandy. Thank you, Dean Norris, and thank you, Dr. Sylvia, for being with us today. We are so pleased to have had the opportunity and the privilege of hosting the 2017 Appalachian Research and Business Symposium. For those of you who don't know, the Appalachian Research and Business Symposium is an annual event hosted by one of four schools, Appalachian State University, Eastern Kentucky University, East Tennessee State University, and Western Carolina University. Each year, one of these schools hosts this research symposium where faculty and students from our respective colleges and universities come together to present and share ideas about research. This year's symposium incorporated 92 participants, around 72 research projects from the four universities. Thank you to all the faculty and the students who participated in this year's event. And I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you to my fellow uh, conference committee members Ms. Donna Lindeberry from Appalachian State University, Dr. Carolyn Rochelle from East, Car excuse me, East Tennessee State University, Dr. Kristen King from Eastern Kentucky University, and Dr. Steve Ha from Western Carolina University. I also want to thank the session chairs and the reviewers who reviewed each of the research submissions and provided valuable feedback to our authors. And a special thanks to Pia Albinson and David Shows who handled our uh, paper proceedings for this event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. John Blackhead, Professor of Economics and the Departmental Chairperson. Thank you, Dean Norris and Dr. Benoit. On behalf of the App State Student Chapter of the National Association for Business Economics, also known as the Economics Club. I first invited Dr. Sylvia to give a talk to the club about what it was like to work as an economist in the private sector. Dr. Sylvia graciously agreed last fall, and we found a date that would work, which happened to be today. A few weeks after we agreed on a date, Dr. Vinoy was looking for a keynote speaker for ARBS, and coincidentally, the dates corresponded. Finally, Dr. Norris realized what an opportunity it was to have Dr. Sylvia on campus, and so here we are in Schaefer Auditorium. My thanks to Dr. Sylvia for being here and performing triple duty today. Now I'd like to invite our club president, Jacqueline Hundley, a senior economics and finance major, to introduce our featured speaker. Thank you, Dr. Whitehead, Dr. Benoit, and Dean Norris. It is my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. John Sylvia, Chief Economist of Wells Fargo. Before I bring Dr. Sylvia to the podium, I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you about the National Association for Business Economics, or NAEP, which is a professional association for business economists and those who use economics in the workplace. 
This year, our Appalachian chapter competed in the College Fed Challenge, winning the regional and district competitions and earning an honorable mention in the national final. Additionally, our members, most of whom are here in attendance today, have created economic impact reports and economic indicators reports that are sent out to local businesses. Past presidents of NAVE include former chairman of the Board of Governors for the Federal Reserve System, Alan Greenspan, several former Federal Reserve Governors and senior business leaders, including today's speaker, Dr. John Sylvia. In addition to his work with NAVE, Dr. Sylvia is actively engaged with our campus and our students. He is a member of several economic and educational advisory committees, including our college's business advisory council. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Sylvia to Appalachian State University. For those of you that are asked at certain times to do an introduction, that's a good model. Short and sweet. Uh, I've always felt that sometimes you go to these, as many of you will someday, uh, be asked to speak with a panel, and you'll find that the introducer uh, oftentimes will read the entire bio. And I've always felt that the presentation has to stand on its own. You will judge the quality of the presentation you will not be impressed by all the accolades that go along with the speaker, but you will remember the quality of the presentation. I think that's probably the number one lesson uh, going forward. So, in terms of economics, what I think is really important in all of business decision making is that you have a framework. Absolutely have a framework for making a decision. And in economics, these are the five fundamentals we deal with. Let me just say, just as an aside, um, if you want a copy of this presentation, please contact Kim or, or someone else here uh, to get an electronic version of this. It's all public information. There are no real secrets on any of this. And uh, I've known over the years that uh, Randy and Harry constantly correct my mistakes in my presentation. So um, you can always ask them for an alternative interpretation of whatever I say. But you can see, and here's your fun, but you have to decide on growth. You have to figure out how fast your sector is growing, your state is growing, your nation is growing, and, and then you can begin after that. Second is inflation, which is very touch and go right now for those of you that are familiar with the Fed's decision making. Interest rates, we'll talk a little bit about that, profit profits and the dollar. So, our number one problem in economics right now is what we call an anchoring bias. It's a tendency intellectually to look at the recent past and decide that the future is going to be the same as the past. Now, for the last three or four years, we've been kind of lucky because it's been like that. You've got about 2% growth, 2.25% growth for four or five years in a row. It is the most unusual period in the post-World War II period. It's the only time we've had that kind of growth. But remember, the Trump administration, whether you like it or not, said that we're going to have change. So as a business person, you have to sit there and think, okay, um, I have to make a decision that I don't know what the change will be. I don't know actually whether it's going to be good or bad. Am I going to have 1% growth or 3% growth? But I know that we're going to have a change. And I think that is absolutely critical in terms of economics. Now, there are two significant challenges. And for someone like me, this is really key because I grew up in an era that some of you may associate with uh, the movie American Graffiti, uh, the TV series Happy Days. It was a very different environment. And so the first lesson, I think, is to always remember that economies evolve. They always change over time. And our first challenge is productivity. We don't have much of it. Excuse me. We don't have much productivity. That is a significant challenge. So for some of you students who have taken economics, basically 101, we're always talking about potential economic growth. What is our potential in the U.S. economy? 
My generation, it was something like three, three and a half percent. Nowadays, the Federal Reserve talks about potential being one and a half to two, in part because of poor productivity. And this is one of the challenges. It's, it's nice when I see the Trump administration talking about stimulus, I put it in the context of saying, okay, you've got to do average demand. Very traditional Keynesian stimulus. I'm going to spend more money, my G goes up, I'm going to cut taxes, all right? I'm going to stimulate the economy, but I look at it this and I say, wait a minute, that's all on the demand side. What are you going to do on the supply side? And so here, productivity is part of that supply side problem. Here we see that we're going to have to do the productivity thing. And in general, in my world, productivity reflects two things, good machines and good workers. And as many of you know in American society today, we have a real challenge. Sometimes, for those of you in, in human resources or looking at the labor market, sometimes you define this as a skills mismatch or a lack of skills. We have a huge labor force in the United States, many of whom don't fit the modern model of what we need as a worker. Uh, certainly in my generation, and again for some of the, the faculty, um, we really didn't grow up with computers. Um, we may have grown up with slide rules, and then calculators that did interesting things, and then batch processing. Uh, we didn't have the laptop and the immediate power that goes along with the laptop today. That's, that's an education that evolves over time. So our number one challenge is we don't have a lot of productivity, we need more machines, but we need better workers. And the second significant problem is the labor force participation rate. This has been a real surprise to a lot of people. Uh, the male labor force participation rate has been going down for about 20 years. Uh, again, an interesting phenomenon. But what really has shocked us in economics is the female participation rate. When you look at the graph, you'll notice pretty clearly, uh, beginning in the 1970s, a lot of women went to college, they got educated, and they started to have careers. And this continued throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but then it stopped. And what we're seeing is lower labor force participation rates among women, including educated women. And so here you have a significant challenge to the economy. Uh, Steve Mnuchin, who's the Treasury Secretary, talks about 3% economic growth on a sustainable basis for the next 10 years. Well, unless you've got better productivity, and unless you've got better labor force growth, that's not going to happen. You can stimulate aggregate demand all you want, but you don't have any supply. You're not generating that supply. So there's a significant challenge there in terms of the overall economy. This is, again, a, an interesting graph to, to, to sort of illustrate the importance of language and communications. Uh, we are not losing our industrial base in the United States. We are globally competitive in manufacturing. But what we've done is we've not hired a lot of workers to do it. Again, for some of you familiar perhaps with the auto industry, producing 16, 17 million cars with one-fourth of the workers we used to have doing that manufacturing. So again, it's important to distinguish between manufacturing output and manufacturing jobs. And contrary to a lot of the rhetoric um, that Harry and I have to deal with, uh, you know, it, it's technology. Uh, technology is the number one factor where we've really substituted really interesting capital for workers. For those of you that have the same problem I do, you watch the History Channel, and you see you know, programs like How Is It Made? Time and time again, you see the huge mechanization that goes into producing the products that we buy today. So again, kind of an interesting distinction. So here's wages, and wages are rising. Uh, and again, that's, that's an interesting challenge, and here is a couple of different ways of looking at wages. Again, very subtle, but the Atlanta Wage Index look at, looks at people who are currently employed and how their wages are going up, and you see that as the highest line. 
The average hourly earnings is just everybody thrown in together. So again, another interesting distinction. So here's a significant challenge, and, and I've been using this graph for quite some time, and it really did help explain the election. So here it is, you look at an America, you're splitting into five quintiles in terms of population. And what you'll notice here is the blue or gray areas, depending upon your view, uh, for the last two economic recoveries, pretty strong income growth, 20% plus, and pretty even among the five quintiles in the United States. But notice what's happened in the last economic recovery, basically the Obama recovery. Uh, no one got 20%, and that second and middle quintile did perform relatively poorly compared to the other quintiles. And that is a good explanation of why it is that people perceive that they're not doing as well as they did in the past, they're not. And it's a good explanation for those two quintiles and why they voted for Donald Trump. Because they do perceive themselves as losing position in the U.S. economy. And they are. So again, kind of an interesting graph when you look at this quintiles. Uh, again, Department of Labor data overall. So here's commercial property. Um, another interesting bit of behavior. Notice surprise. When you look at the central business district office space, which is the highest line that's up there, uh, you see a very different performance than the suburban office space. What has surprised a lot of people is the great suburbanization of work stopped. And that more and more people, more and more firms want to be in the poor city. They don't want to be 20, 30, 40 miles outside the poor city. I think that's a real surprise for commercial real estate in the United States. The second surprise, uh, which is not surprising, and um, you know, we were talking earlier, Dean Norris and I, and she was mentioning about my travel. Um, I'm the kind of person, um, I've been to Paris 20 times, I've never been to France. And what you see happening for business people like me is when you do that Shanghai to San Francisco, Shanghai to Los Angeles, Shanghai to Chicago flight, a lot of those business people fly over, they get into the city, they say this is a nice city, okay? They go to P.F. Chang's for Chinese food, and, and what happens is they stay in the city and they buy something in the city. So what this shows you is a significant difference between that entry-level city and all the other cities around it. Really key. I was earlier, um, no, last year I went to a Houston Astros baseball game, and it was fascinating. When you look in the outfield, you see those bulletin boards, advertisements, two of them from Middle Eastern Airlines. In other words, they want the direct flight from the Middle East right into Houston, because they recognize that's where the action is. So Miami, Boston, <coughs> Dallas Airport, New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago. All of these have this really unique characteristic about commercial real estate and the economy. So here's federal fiscal policy. Um, this is one area where I certainly do disagree with the Trump administration. When you look at that graph over there, uh, it's entitlements. No matter how you cut it, it's entitlements. And if I'm a millennial, I'm mad as hell. Because I'm looking at that graph and I'm saying, that's my implied future tax burden. I'm an economist, that's what we do, we discount the future, we look at the whole problem. We have a huge problem. And a lot of it does have to do with health care. And a lot of you appreciate that health care inflation is rising faster than the overall CPI. So all this stuff about cutting out budgets for endowments, and, you know, the EPA, all this other stuff, that's all a sidebar. It's a sideshow. The real show is how we're going to deal with entitlements going forward. And every time you watch an ad on TV about free catheters and free knee braces and free scooters, you should be saying in the back of your head, in economics, nothing is free. Somebody is paying for that. Welcome to the millennial generation. You're paying for that. And you should be mad as hell. 
And then on the other side, you see the Congressional Budget Office numbers, and for those of you that saw the CBO report that came out just recently, it's even worse. I had to laugh at one of my, one of my fellow colleagues. Um, it, it was like last year, the debt situation's unsustainable. And this year, it's a little bit worse. So I was saying to him, oh, well, I don't understand. It's unsustainable. How is it more unsustainable? You know, but yeah, there's your problem. We've got huge implied for future burdens with respect to dealing with the, the basically retirement and health care of the baby boom generation. Uh, again, a challenge of expectations, a challenge about how we're going to pay for all these bills, and it really is a challenge. Uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is uh, the share of federal taxes, I think is an il interesting illustration, because people talk about personal income tax cuts. Problem is, if you're going to cut the personal income tax cut, you're going to do the personal income tax cut, you're going to be cutting taxes for people who pay the tax. And when you look at the graph, you realize it's the highest quintile, quintile that pays most of the tax. So all this political rhetoric, about we're going to cut taxes, but we can't cut taxes for the rich. Guess what? It's the rich to pay the tax. So now you get a problem, a very practical problem in terms of personal income tax. Uh, again, uh, some of the other issues you can look at a little bit on that. Here's inflation. So we talked a little bit about the Fed. Really interesting. When you look as a business person, you realize for the last three to five years, anybody selling a good has had zero pricing power. So if you want to know why Macy's has a problem, if you want to know why a lot of these, like Sears has a problem, right? There is no pricing power because, again, for the millennial generation in particular, it's not surprising to you that you would go online and basically shop for anything you're interested in. Or you take your phone into any shopping area and immediately get different prices. Companies have very little pricing power with respect to goods, but they do have for services. And if you look at the other line, you'll notice those service prices are moving up. So again, an interesting pricing difference between goods and services in the U.S. economy. A little bit with respect to interest rates, so this is the dot plot that some of you have heard about from time to time. What is key today in terms of interest rates is the change direction. For the last three or four years, all the equity markets, bond markets, we were very comfortable making money because every time the Fed issued a dot plot, the rates came down. And you can make money as long as interest rates are coming down. Well, guess what? Now the, the dot plot shifted up. The game is more even. Now you have to deal with the challenge of the Fed may raise rates. We don't know how much they're going to raise rates. We expect that they will raise rates in June. And this is part of the problem. If you look at what the federal funds rate is, and you look at what the inflation number is, and again, earlier today, the Fed's PE, PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditure Deflator, the inflation index, hit their target of 2%. I haven't done that since 2012. And what the bond market is thinking is, oh, wait a minute, the Fed now has plenty of room to raise the federal funds rate 50 to 75 to 100 basis points and still be at the neutral level. Now, one of the great challenges going on in economics today is illustrated by Chair Yellen in a recent uh, testimony. We don't actually know what that interest rate should be. Uh, is the real rate, should be a positive one, negative one, zero? For those of you that may have said a little bit of monetary economics and, and did monetary policy, there's something called a Taylor rule. And Taylor, rule was assu Taylor assumed that the number was two. So here you have a major source of uncertainty in the marketplace. But you see, the Fed easily can raise rates twice this year, and probably one or two times next year. So again, when you're out there thinking about, you know, my financing something next year, um, the short-run interest rate will probably be a little bit higher. This is a, an interesting illustration of, of the challenge that many of us have, is that 
In the United States, we sell a lot of debt to foreign investors. That's important to understand. Um, sometimes you'll hear the rhetoric that we want to get rid of the trade deficit. Well, if you have the misfortune of actually missing that lecture when you're a student, um, part of the other side of the trade deficit is capital flows. And what you see here is we are, and we have been for a long time, dependent on foreign investors buying our bonds, our agencies, our mortgage-backed securities. Uh, really key, you can see here the importance of, of what we're looking at in terms of the actual numbers, in terms of ABC debt, corporate debt, we sell a lot of our corporate bonds to foreign investors. So again, it's kind of tricky. I mean, if you want to yell at the Mexicans, you want to yell at the Chinese, you want to yell at everybody, that's wonderful, but also don't forget they're buying our bonds. And if they get pretty upset at the way you yell at them, um, they may not be buying the bonds. So again, kind of a tricky situation. So this is where companies make money, if you look at the S&P. And once again, it surprises a lot of people. Uh, on average, about 30, about one third of S&P revenues are earned abroad. We truly have a lot of multinational companies that operate in a lot of markets. It's not us versus them. It's us versus us. All right, that's what we're doing. And especially if you like IT. If you're an investor and you're buying Apple and all those other great companies, look at that graph. Over 50% of their revenues are actually earned abroad. Are they worried about our trade relationships with China? You better believe they are. Are they disappointed that we dropped TPP? Yeah, you better believe they are. So again, you know, we're dealing with the global economy, and as an economist, and again, you know, when you, when you get back to one of your lectures and you want to talk to one of your professors and ask them a question, globalization is not the same as mercantilism. And unfortunately, what we've done, I think, in political rhetoric, is we've said globalization is evil. And no, because we all benefit from globalization in terms of the goods we buy and our travel, et cetera, et cetera. What we're really concerned about is what we call mercantilism. And as an economist, I will say, you know, in my opinion, we have never had free trade. We never will have free trade. There is always some barrier, tariff, non-tariff barrier, rules, regulations. That's the way the world works. So all this rhetoric about we need free trade, we need free trade is nonsense. We might need freer trade, but we're not going to have free trade. Again, there's always going to be something in the way that I think is absolutely true. So this is a graph I was talking with a couple of people earlier. Uh, this is non-financial domestic profits. And what's key in this graph is notice that it always peaks. These profit margins peak mid-cycle. And then they start to go down. But they don't go back up. They peak. They go down, and they continue to go down until you have the recession, and then they come up again. So again, this series is kind of an interesting illustration of that cyclical behavior that's behind all our economic numbers. This is the dollar, incredibly strong. But here, again, is our top seven trading partners. Now, what's interesting about this, to me as an economist, is three of these countries are in Asia. There's a tendency in rhetoric to think that, well, you know, all our cultural, institutional history is all tied to Europe. Um, oftentimes on many, many campuses, and certainly in high schools, there's a course called Western Civilization. And you kind of get that, that bias in your thinking. But here you can see in America today, uh, China, Japan, and South Korea are in that list of three of the top seven trading partners in the United States. And you can see the variety of how much the dollar has changed. So oftentimes as a business person, the dollar is not relevant. If you see it on CNBC or Bloomberg or Nightly News or you read it in the USA Today, that's a pretty useless number. You want to know what your company is doing relative to the market that it's in over time and perhaps hedge that currency. And you can see the tremendous variety of behavior. Obviously, the UK reflects the Brexit uh, vote over time. 
So this is a graph I was talking about earlier too. It, it, it's great to yell at Mexico, all right? That's a, that's a convenient, nice, you know, punching bag, but that's not relevant for trade. Right. Canada and Mexico are not a trade problem. Our problem is mostly Asia and it's mostly China. If you want to know the individual balances over time. But you can see in the graph, it's, you know, it's great to yell at the Mexicans, fine, the next door. Okay, they don't have an NFL franchise, so we can yell at them. Uh, but you know, it, it, this is so silly. And, and again, I, I was talking with Dean Norris, and, and oftentimes the challenge is, we don't seem to be able to identify or say the real problem, all right? We, we kind of just sort of make up some story of high in the sky about the real problem, all right? For me, as an economist, immigrants are not the problem, all right? If you're in eastern North Carolina and you want to process poultry and you want to process hogs, uh, you better have some immigrants. If you're in Charlotte and you're putting up houses, you better have immigrants to put up the framing on the house. It's a society that's always built. I grew up in Massachusetts, and there's a city in Massachusetts named Lowell. And for those of you that are familiar with Massachusetts, you yeah. know Lowell. But there was a Lowell. There was a guy named Lowell at one point. And what did he do? He couldn't get farm girls to come and work in the textile mills. So what did he do? He got Irish girls over on a boat, and they came in a boat. He set up a dormitory, had a dormitory mom, and that's where the Irish girls worked. We had Italian, Italian people who worked in the textile industry. We have always had immigrants, immigrants from over here. To me, if you told most Americans, the problem is immigrants who commit crimes. That's the problem. Okay, fine. I understand. That's the problem. That's what people are upset about. Immigrants, who cares? They show up, they do the work, everything's fine. Get over it. Uh, this is another I interesting issue. For some of you, you will read in economics um, an export-dependent model. In other words, countries develop based upon export growth. And what you can see is this is an interesting challenge to that model of economic development. Uh, export growth has really slowed down in terms of volumes. And so if you have an export-driven model, Right, always the argument of the Chinese. It's an export-driven model. You can see, in a way, why some of these countries have become more internal in their focus, because that export growth has slowed down over time. That's the Chinese forecast for us. This is a global growth for us. And again, my five fundamentals in terms of what I did. Uh, you know, in terms of a long time ago, I was very lucky. Um, I was good in math. And I uh, think that uh, that helped me do economics at the time, because economics was just beginning to do all the math that made it an interesting subject. So I decided that uh, I was going to absolutely get my PhD. Uh, if you think about the movie American Graffiti, at the end, for those of you that have never seen the movie, it's a great lesson for my generation. Uh, you really get some insight. It's important to understand that only one of those kids ever went to college. And so when you're dealing with my generation, a lot of these people didn't go to college, but especially people like me who went to college, decided that I needed a PhD in economics. And I went, and at my time, and again, you know, Harry and others will say the same thing, uh, a lot of my colleagues did ABD, all but dissertation. And that was fine when you're 25, 30 years old, and you can pull that stunt. But by the time you get to be 30 or 40, uh, you will not be the chief economist of Wells Fargo or any other bank or any other major institution without the PhD. You need the advanced degree, and that was key. The other thing I decided to do is I needed the experience. I taught at Indiana University. I worked in Chicago for a firm called Kemper. Then I was the chief economist of the Senate Banking Committee. It was very important to me. If you're going to be a good economist, you need to do the academic work, you need to work in the private sector, and you need to work in government at the federal level to really understand how economic decisions are being made. And before we do some questions, I'll just finish up with my personal opinion. Um, I'm very frustrated at the lack of quality of decision making that's going on. I firmly believe that you do the research first before you talk. 
And what I see now in, in going on is we're, we're simply talking about something and we're not doing the research. And I find that that is, again, very frustrating. You can tell by my comments on the immigrant issue. I don't think enough research was being done. I think the failure of the Affordable Care Act, again, reflected a lack of research, a lack, a lack of thought about what really needed to change. Um, and they were just focused on, on, on other issues over there. And, and then, as you can tell, uh, in my generation, we never started out with a computer. So it's very important to understand that you have to constantly learn. You stop, stop learning when you're 30, 35, 40, you think you've got it made, you're out the door at 45, and you're gonna struggle to get that next job. You have to constantly be adaptable, willing to move, willing to change titles, uh, willing to constantly uh, learn about your profession and where it's going forward. So I'm firmly welcome to take some questions if we have time. And uh, go from there. So, uh, some faculty member can moderate the questions and, and identify who's who's asking, and we can go from there. So, questions, comments, feel free. I mean, you know, you're not going to get graded on this. There's a question over here. Give me the technology. Give me the, the term. UVI? Oh, heck yes. We've been doing that for 200 years. Absolutely. Uh, the question again, it, our automating labor services. And I would say absolutely. Whether it begins with simply phone banks, uh, automated. Again, I find it frustrating that I will call and have to hit five or six buttons before something actually happens. Uh, but again, that's, that is the way it's going to go because to me as an economist, what's your alternative? Your alternative is to wait half an hour, 45 minutes for a human being to answer the phone. Um, it doesn't do you any good and doesn't do the company any good. So I think, yeah, we'll do a lot of labor services. I mean, I always, there's this discussion in healthcare about robots doing surgery. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, yeah, that sounds pretty romantic and wonderful and everything, but I think we're a little bit away from that. But definitely, uh, in terms of services, uh, we're, we're doing that. You know, again, the comment about, I get frustrated and I've seen it, and perhaps some of you faculty members have seen this too. People have been talking about technology replacing people for a long time, okay? But somebody has to design the machine, somebody has to program the machine, Somebody has to sit there and try to invent the machine. I mean, that's your job. I mean, you're going to sit there and just say, oh, geez, you know, the technology, some machine's going to replace me. That's fine. Some machine will replace you. But no machine, you know, goes through the process of all that programming. You have to get it done by human being. And that's what's really important. Yes, sir. So the gentleman's question about involvement in the labor market, basically labor force participation rates have to be improved. Um, you know, unfortunately, it all, for an economist, it all comes down to incentives. Uh, you have to incentivize people to work and you say, okay, you make more money, you get to keep more money. So you have to deal with the marginal tax rate on people. And sometimes the marginal tax rate is, is pretty high. One of the challenges we have in our society is single mothers. Single mother considered home with a kid, $25,000 a year. Rent subsidies, food subsidies, those, all of this is one little free iPhone. All right? She goes to get a job for $32,000, guess what happens? Her take home pay is less. We have that little donut hole in the system where low income workers generally don't have a lot of skills. Actually, you're better off sitting at home. Right? Disability, a uh, huge disability problem in the last 20 years. We make it way too easy to get disability. I know some of you think, well, that's hard, harder. No. 
When you look at the data, you realize a lot of people on disability could be working, should be working. All right? We all have people with severe disabilities. So I think, again, that's part of the problem. Um, you, you subsidize le leisure and you tax effort. Um, in economics 101, that's not a good situation. You have to, you have to do that. Um, I think, again, one of, the, one of the problems from my generation, and you see that, is that what we end up, all right, and it's up, you, know, you end up in a situation where, in my generation, there was nobody in front of me, okay? Um, half of the World War II generation got killed or severely injured, they didn't go to college. Okay, so someone like me coming out of college, all right, oh, you must be smart, you got a college degree, go be a manager, all right? Because there wasn't anybody in front of me. For your generation, you've got two or three generations in front of you who have college degrees, have been managers, have worked themselves up. So you can't simply go to an employer and say, I got a college degree, hire me. Uh, you have to figure out what is my college degree, what are my specialties, what am I really doing? And unfortunately, uh, over the last 30 or 40 years, we've created a lot of college degrees in subjects no one cares about. And great, I'm glad you're a major and you got a degree and exactly how am I going to use this degree in, in the job? And that's what you need to think about. You know, what have you actually studied? What can you bring to the table for somebody? You can't just walk in and say, I got a college degree, hire me. It ain't going to happen, pal. All right? And you see this, quite frankly, I see this in a lot of urban environments. When I know Don well, when I walk into a Starbucks, that person behind the counter oftentimes is very intelligent, has a college degree, and is a barista. Now, I'm sorry, I am not impressed. You spent sixty, eighty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 for your education at least, and you're doing a barista thing? Okay, I guess that's cool, but it ain't me. So I'm saying, you know, that's not going to happen. All right, sorry, I'm old school, tough old Yankee from Massachusetts. None of my kids are baristas. You know, you let a fire under their butt, they go get a real job. So again, I would think that would be key. You have to think about what you're studying, where you're going to school to make a difference. There are winners and losers in true trade. Now, did you really did you really read Arthur? You read his stuff? That's pretty impressive. Plenty to do. Uh, so the gentleman's question is, is the age-old problem is that oftentimes the benefits of trade are widely dispersed, but the costs are really focused. For anybody in this room, uh, you probably get cheaper t-shirts, cheaper uh, slippers, flip-flops. Um, you have access to amazing, well, for some of you guys, amazing beers around the world. Okay, so you walk in and you're getting benefits from all that stuff, and for you, on average each year, you probably benefit maybe $500 to $2,000 worth of your income. Those prices are lower than what you would have otherwise, or in fact, you have a product you would not be able to accept, access to it. The problem oftentimes, especially in North Carolina, is the textile costs are very focused. It's Gastonia, it's Kannapolis, all right? It's Pillow Techs, 6,000 people lose their jobs. And so, you know, what is your policy response? Uh, again, to me as an economist, it's you've got to give these people retraining. You've got to say, listen, uh, listen, pal, uh, this job's not coming back. It's the old Bruce Springsteen song. The job's not coming back. The sure as hell is not coming back to your hometown. And you've got to get a new trade, and you may have to move. And also, you need to, I think, again, uh, you've got to spend a little money on moving these people. 
give that two, three thousand dollars and say, yes, you can move. We're going to give you money to move somewhere. So you're going to have a lot of more retraining, serious retraining, and a lot more in terms of moving. But yes, uh, the, the, the I think you've got to be honest, and I don't think, quite frankly, a lot of politicians are honest. Right? Um, you've got to be Bruce Springsteen. This job is not coming back. Um, you know, for those of you that know something about music, and, you know something. Oh, that's it. Okay. Go ahead. Summers, Lori Summers, right? Yeah. Now, this is not the one about him complaining about women in yeah. science, is it? No. I don't want to deal with that one. So, no, no, I, um, you, in, in my world, uh, you can do a lot, well, some of you may be exposed to this, we do a lot of state space analysis, because for us, it's very important to try to identify a structural break in the series. Is this series the same as it was before? And in my work at Wells Fargo, we, for the most part, we only focus on 1982 to now. That period from World War II to 1982 is not relevant as far as I'm concerned for 90% of the work we do. Um, there's, a, there's a concept called mean reversion and, and that just doesn't, doesn't work. So when you talk about labor force participation rates, I have no problem with that segment of U.S. society, especially 55 and older, that has enough money that they decide, you know, I don't really want to be fully involved. I want to do an alternate career. There's a, there's a commercial on TV where this, uh, I think it's for TD um, Enterprise. And anyway, this guy is talking to this lady and he says to the lady, you know, what do you want to do about retirement? Something, and then she, he says something about, no, no, I mean before that. Um, I have no problem with that segment of society that is very wealthy, and, or wealthy enough, let's put it that way, and some of you will make that decision at some day, you'll say, well, you know, I'm 55, 60, and my wife is 55, 60, we've got enough, we can do it, Let, let's go live a simple life in an alternative place. The problem with participation rates in the United States is the 25 to 54. That's the prime age. You, you finish most of your education, and you're not working. What in the heck is going on here? And that's what makes part of that new normal uh, so frustrating. Our labor force participation rates are down for those groups in society. And again, I'll go back to that gentleman's question. Um, a lot of it has to do with the marginal tax rates. A lot of it has perceptions in terms of lifestyle, what you really want to achieve or not. Um, you have a lot of families today where the wife may be very well educated. She has one or two children. And she says, I'm just staying home and I'm doing homeschool education. And that's a social decision. But in terms of potential GDP, it does make a difference in our society that that has slowed down. So yes, I would say to some extent, extent in a lot of economic surveys, there is a new normal. And what you will have to do, and 
all your fellow students here, um, is try to recognize that societies always evolve over time. You cannot force fit today's society. The 21st century America has, no, has very little to do with the 1960s and 70s of America. Time and time again, for those of you that look at any of the data, it's important to appreciate, now I'll just, I know I'm taking up a lot of the Dean's time and I don't want to do that, but I, I need to finish, I want to finish this one point. One of the problems that I have philosophically, and I won't pick out what the guy says, um, but you've got to appreciate, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the U.S. was pretty unique, okay? We pretty much destroyed Japan and Germany. Uh, Russia was doing whatever the heck they were doing. Brazil was having military hunters, and Mexico was doing this takeover and that takeover, and China was just so insular. There was no major competitor in terms of economic power in the United States for a good 30 years after World War II. Um, and it really wasn't until the OPEC situation with oil that really woke us up into, into a more modern society. And, and so when, when you think about that, what I don't like is people who go back and say, geez, you know, the U.S. share of GDP is not what it used to be. Congratulations, pal. I'll tell you why. The world's evolved, all right? We have to deal with all these other characters and all these other countries. So, you know, I think you, you don't want to try to recreate a society that was really unique. And just leave it alone, admire it, go see the old movies, you know, go see the old Elvis Presley movies and all that stuff. It's really fun. Got it. I understand. But that's, put that in a vault somewhere. That is not a basis for good economic decision making. So, sorry to take up some of your time. Thank you. Thanks, John, for those very deep and frank uh, insights into the way the world works and the way money flows and the way economies ebb and flow. Um, you know, one of my favorite things that you said, and I, I think I'm going to requote it if I can and, and apply it in other settings as well, is it's not us versus them. It's us versus us. I really like that. Um, and I, I like your comment there too about the world is, is changing and we can't return to the past and, and that's one of the things that we try to do in higher ed is to prepare our students for an ever-changing world to have those fundamental liberal arts skills and to be able to do the problem solving, to, do, to be able to communicate effectively and to give them some business knowledge but then to be adaptable and ready for anything because as you've said so well today we don't know what the future is going to be we can try to predict it but we certainly don't know what that'll be uh, we do have a, a presentation um, and john if you would join me and also jacqueline somewhere in this general area So this is our symbol of the Boyle's Lecture Series, the American Eagle. The eagle symbolizes strength, gracefulness, keenness of vision, and power of flight. John, your passion for what you do clearly comes through and you possess all of these traits. So we'd like to give you this as a token with an inscription. And I hope, John, you'll be able to stick around for a few um, questions and, and answers during this reception that follows. We do have um, a reception in the Schaefer Center lobby for all of you. And uh, appreciate, again, the students, faculty, staff, our guests from the Appalachian Region Business Symposium and, and other special guests for attending today's lecture. I hope you are inspired to be innovative and engaged leaders who positively impact our community. Thank you from Appalachian State University and the Walker College of Business and have a purposeful driven day.